speak on the mic, please, otherwise we won't be able to translate. Thank you. Yo para calentar motores. La nave yeah. What was now Victoria? Was it uh, clinker built? <laughs> what do you think about it? Okay, I'm, I'll, I'll start. <clears throat> I think it was carveled below the waterline and clinkered in the upper works. Eric, what do you think? Uh, this is the same thing, uh, carvel for the under of the um, water line and a clinker above the water line. And uh, this structure is uh, also used in Cavalier uh, shipwreck. Uh, we're very lucky because we have a wreck that dates from 1470, I think, more or less. If I'm not uh, wrong. If I'm not mixing dates here, it is a ship that Brad and I worked on a long time ago, maybe 26 years ago, even more, in Cavalier. Brad called me and we spent a month working there. And I had to uh, work as naval um, modelist or mock-up maker. It was great. It was very interesting, really. And um, that shipwreck uh, is uh, from an allegedly Basque ship. And uh, we were very lucky because it, it matches uh, now Victoria's tonnage. It's a bit um, uh, from an earlier date, but it has the same um, uh, size. It's a flat uh, hull, clinker built, and uh, it's a very interesting shipwreck. There are some question marks about whether it had. Um, a square tug or not, but if it didn't have it back then, probably in the period, in the time of now Victoria in 1521, it would have had it. Um, I think that still need to research deeper there, but in taking all the archaeological data into consideration, we can make a very interesting um, scientific, uh, scientific theory. Uh, concerning now Victoria, you mentioned something there. Uh, you mentioned the square tuck and whether the, uh, the Cavalier and Victoria had it or not. Um, I know that uh, currently uh, the Naval Museum in Madrid has a project to build a mock-up of now Victoria, and uh, apparently the uh, stern they're thinking of is not a square tuck, but a round one. Yes, but in the iconography of the, that time, in the, in the, in the maps, we clearly see the square tuck. So I think I don't, I don't think it's a uh, right decision. Iconography tells us the opposite. Pros and cons. Because one of the things that are menor velocidad being uh, mentioned here is a lower speed if we use a square tuck versus not having a square tuck. This is what uh, we are speaking about here. If we take into consideration the distances covered, hmm? what are the pros and cons of the systems? 
of the two possibilities. I mean, I'm going to be t asking you later on about clinker and Carvel systems uh, uh, so that we can move on in uh, our discussion. I, I think we have to be consistent. Um, if you have a Carvel hull, it's very, well, if you have a clinker hull, um, you can have a double-ended ship, um, and it's harder to have a square stern if you have a clinker hull. Uh, once you have a carvel hull, then you can have a square stern. So I think those two go together. Um, the only thing we can really rely on in this particular case is iconography. And iconography for the 16th century uh, begins to show square stirrings with a lot of regularity. Um, you were mentioning the time of the voyage, the distance of the voyage, and so on. Uh, we tend to associate clinker hulls with shorter voyages, as in several weeks, and not several months. And that's for the reasons of maintenance. The, the joints are easier to maintain. They don't get dirty. They don't get the sea creatures don't attach themselves in the same way. So I think the carval hull is better suited for lengthy trans-oceanic voyages. That's my idea on it. Una idea, una idea, de, de, de hecho es, es un relato del siglo XV. Uh, ahora no, no me acuerdo uh, quién es uh, uh, concretamente, pero hay un italiano que estuvo a las órdenes de, de Felipe, uh, de Af Afonso V el Magnánimo, uh, navegando en, en sus galeras por el Mediterráneo Occidental a mediados del siglo XV. Y de hecho en su, en su relato uh, hace mención a las embarcaciones tincladas y, y de hecho me parece que es el único texto en italiano que, eh, que hace referencia a, est, a este término. Y él, cuando habla de las embarcaciones tingladas, uh, dice que son muy difíciles de, de mantener, que son enormemente complicadas de, 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 de reparar. Por tanto, yo, yo creo que el problema, más que, más que en la construcción, se encontraría en, en su mantenimiento, en la reparación, que es mucho más complicada. A reparar una embarcación a tingla de ello que no una embarcación a tope. Eso es lo que dice él a mediados del siglo XV. En mi opinión, a la vista de lo que han comentado otros, otros investigadores, la diferencia radica entre popa plana y popa redonda en la necesidad de optimizar el espacio. Between, uh, flat and round stern uh, is optimizing uh, the cargo because a part of the structure would uh, be raised uh, in one of the cases uh, and then you would lose a possibility for cargo, a percentage for cargo. So that vertical line uh, cutting uh, into the stern post uh, it makes more sense uh, when it comes to optimizing cargo. Much more so than with a round stern. I was trying to remember where I read uh, this, this hypothesis, this uh, explanation, and I can't, I'm sorry. But it, that might explain the change, right? Technological change uh, at the time, mostly in uh, medium sized uh, ships. I understand your argument, but it's not really the cargo, it's the living space in the, in the main deck and upper deck that really gains in, in volume. Once you cantidad de volumen tremendo, tienes razón, sí. Y el aspecto de la velocidad, pues bueno, eh, yo creo que una popa redonda sí que puede ir algo más, es algo más hidrodinámico, pero no creo que la diferencia sea muy significativa. Y de hecho, no creo que hoy, a día de hoy eh, podamos llegar a esa conclusión, que haya una gran diferencia entre un casco u otro. Me parece muy arriesgado. Yo veo que un barco con una popa cuadrada 
puede ser, puede navegar muy rápidamente también, en fin, eh, no, no, no tiene por qué ser un barco lento en absoluto, ¿no? Eh, pero yo creo que es incontestable al ver la iconografía y ver que ya sus barcos ya estaban representados con popa cuadrada, ¿no? Ya, ya está, ¿no? No hay, no hay que discutir más. Y bueno, yo aquí quería aportar un poco mi experiencia como... If I may, I wanted to tell you how after traveling, uh, sorry, after sailing uh, for over 25 years, um, I wouldn't want to be in a round stern in a massive storm at sea because they're super dangerous, uh, hard to control. The, the, the square stern uh, is much easier to, to handle, safer. Good afternoon. I agree with some of the technical explanations that have been given. Uh, I think that uh, the change from the round stern to the square stern uh, was because it gives more room uh, for um, to carry equipment, for living space, and uh, it's cheaper to build. Uh, and easier to build at the shipyard. The square stern uh, is easier to build and the shipyard would probably uh, make it, uh, make more profit in that case. About uh, the difference in speed, I think it probably depends uh, on how fast that particular typology uh, would be. For faster uh, typologies, then the square stern makes more sense, which is why yachts uh, at marinas, uh, you will have noticed that the stern uh, is straight. Why? Because uh, Water uh, doesn't uh, catch on the stern, uh, there's less resistance, it just um, slides off, as it were. For instance, uh, in the fishing techniques in Ondarroa, for instance, uh, those uh, fishing boats uh, have a square stern, but it's really, really Deep, right? Why? Because they're drifters. Uh, that means they're slow. Uh, why? Because uh, water kind of sticks to the stern. These uh, ship, uh, fishing ships uh, throw the net and then they need a, like a, a secondary support point uh, well, I'm just going into too much detail the speaker says uh, so uh, when we talk about the difference in speed between a round or a square stern it depends on how fast that, that typology uh, was meant to be uh, the round stern uh, made sense uh, when um, engines, the first engines, uh, were not particularly powerful, the ships were slow, so that made sense. But as engines became more powerful and uh, uh, when vessels uh, started to be built in steel, uh, where the square stern is easier to manufacture, then that's where fishing boats uh, in the northern Iberian coast uh, started to all have square stern. What, what we find archaeologically <coughs> uh, related to the, uh, the, uh, the stern is that um, on a ship like the San Juan, which, has a, which is about four meters in the water, uh, the, the stern post is actually, it actually comes to a point for a height of about 1.8 meters. So it's about half the, de half the depth of the water is actually affected by the square stern. So that's where you have, yes, you do have a bit of turbulence in the area where there's a square stern, but it's only half the depth of the ship. 
so the rudder can act very efficiently in the bottom two meters of that's underwater and uh, in the top two meters yes there's less efficiency because of the turbulence uh, the rudder is also not as wide at the bottom as it is on top so from the point of view of handling the ship that uh, turbulence factor is is minimized by the the, the tuck at the back of the ship. Um, when we did our, um, our computerized sailing tests of the San Juan, uh, we found that its optimal uh, sailing speed was between seven and nine knots. That's not very fast, um, but it's pretty good. Uh, depending on its sailing setup, the, the, the rigging setup, um, it could sail up to 60% or si sorry, 60 degrees into the wind. So it's not a particularly good ship for sailing against the wind. So 90 degrees would be, would be like this and 60 degrees would be like this. And any, any headwinds that are, that are closer to the bow, the ship lost uh, its, its power very quickly. Um, so these are general parameters for sailing and for moving through the water. And when you're moving at seven to nine knots, the turbulence in the back that's created by the square stern is not a huge factor, I think. My question is more about why you believe there would be the Carvel below and lap strake or clinker above. Is it because there are archaeological examples or icon iconography again? I, th I think the short answer is that's what the archaeology shows. Uh, we don't really have a, an understanding of it, <clears throat> but these could be uh, residual technologies that uh, are still around. Um, we don't really understand why. So there are examples of boats with both styles, with the carvel below the waterline and clinker above the waterline. Well, the primary examples are from Cavalier sur Mer, which, is, which has a 1479 dendro date, and the Mary Rose um, from England, uh, which was rebuilt in uh, 1535. It was built, built in, in 1519, but it was rebuilt in 1536. Uh, 36, yeah. So that's the, that, that chronological period is what we're relying on and we suggest that it would be clinker above the waterline. Um, above the waterline, that can mean different things. In the case of Cavalier sur mer um, the clinker started very quickly above the waterline, say 30 to 40 centimeters above the greatest breadth of the hull. Whereas in the Mary Rose, uh, the clinker construction starts above the upper deck and is actually only the, the, the castles. See you. Me pregunto si a veces no tratamos de ser demasiado simplistas. We are not very simplistic when it comes to types of ships. What I mean is that we have more terms uh, referring to um, ships that we don't know uh, about. I mean, there are mixed types of uh, ships like Galizabras and Gabras in Spanish. Uh, there's a mixture uh, there and uh, on the basis of iconography there's a picture uh, in Seville uh, in, 
from late 16, where you can see many different ships, minor and smaller ships, just used to cross a river. And some of them are covered, some other are not. There are hybrids in there. So sometimes we take one archaeological element and we uh, tend to use the most popular term and match it with uh, what we see. But we don't know about the reality of the time. Um, probably there is such a huge revolution uh, in terms of technology that do mention that there are different elements used uh, to see what works best. Mixing things, mixing ideas from different styles and from different seas. It's just an open comment for all of you. Um. Yes, you're right. We tend to make things simpler, but I would say that reality is much more complex than what we just told you about. Uh, from my personal experience, I can tell you that in Catalan papers from 14th to 15th century, in order to simplify things, normally they divided back then ships between nows, yanes, and uh, uh, depending on the size, and then we have Lyras uh, as well. And there are different terms used there for larger and smaller boats. So the term now, leño, or barca in Spanish. It is true that it's, it's generic. I mean, it uh, covers a whole uh, number of ships. But if you take other documents uh, uh, or inventories, etc., you will have many more terms, many more names for the ships. Uh, so in the group of nows, you have barshas, you have uh, cogs, and many others depending on their uh, loading capacity. So we have a, a whole typology here. And uh, it is also very complex to identify what uh, the ships look like uh, at a given moment in time or over a period of time, because you have a term in the 13th century, 14th and 15th. The term may be the same, but it might not be applied to the same ship, because it evolves. And now in the Mediterranean, in the 13th century, has a, a very specific aspect uh, and in the 15th century that will have nothing to do. It changes completely. And it could happen that a ship stays the same, more or less, but then you have new terms being used in the different centuries and now, and the cog, for instance, are used uh, to uh, name the same type of ship. Uh, in the 14th century, you have a cog used more widely, and then it changes into now. So it's complex, and we need to be very careful here. Add one thing here concerning terminology. I know it's very confused, and uh, uh, it makes things even more complex because on the one hand you have uh, international context and you have uh, the Venetian, Catalans, Andalusians, uh, Portuguese, Basques, uh, English, French. And then you have in a country you have um, you have um, the uh, registrars that may write things down in Basque sometimes. So a, a registrar in Madrid, how is that person going to call a, a, a ship? Well, we don't know. And as for the Basque language, I don't know what terms are used, but I'm sure Antilla, uh, Andilla, and Chiquilla, which is ship big and small. That's it. I'm sure those were the terms used. Uh, it's like in the case of chalupas, chalupa un dia, chalupa chiquilla, which means uh, large or small chalupa, and that's it. As for uh, ships, over time, uh, they've uh, stayed mostly the same. We see that in traineras, when you uh, get the best trainera one year, next year everybody's copied that. And that's happened uh, over time in fishing. Every decade you have 
or uh, fishing uh, ships, which are the same in all ports. You, there aren't large differences, really. When you have a boat that works well, um, then everybody copies it. Uh, the best ships are copied systematically, and that's how things have evolved empirically. And this goes uh, faster than any uh, study, any abstract study. And I have studies on com traineras used for competitions that have been tested in different tanks in Southampton, etc., thinking that they were going to break all records in La Concha in San Sebastian. And on the contrary, they've been last. So the state-of-the-art science couldn't um, overcome or improve the empirical knowledge of uh, uh, riverside competitors. So, so, so sometimes really we want to have we want to see different ships where actually uh, it's uh, about the same ships it's just uh, size that changes um, I'm surprised by researchers on ships in 16th century. I'm surprised they're not uh, looking at recent um, dates, 18th, 19th century, where you see that all typologies or names of the ships are related mostly not to the type of hull they have. They really don't care. It's about um, rigging. They have two masts, so one is taller than the other. And the same thing goes to Lugre, to Marine, which is practically the same. Uh, and the, the same thing can be applied to many ships. A Bergantin uh, can have the hull you want, but what matters is the rigging, which is what you see from far away. And um, it's what matters at the end of the day. And when you speak about a caravel, I, I feel, I don't know, but I feel that it could be quite similar to uh, what we call a navio in Spanish, below 100 tons, which has a Latin type of sail. I believe it could be that type of uh, ship, and that's associated to Portuguese caravels. Uh, and we need Latin sails. Sometimes you try to uh, think that things are very complicated, but they're not. Oh, it might be the opposite. If you look at uh, the terms we use to Zarao Getaria Norio, to the, the, you know, we call your ship Vaporea. That's what we call the San Juan. That's the term we use in Basque. Huh? Uh, steamship. Yes, and um, a fishing boat is called a chalupie uh, as well in my uh, town, my hometown. It doesn't make sense because it's a fishing boat, but that's that's how things are. It's um, a terminology that is still there and that makes things uh, uh, more complex. For us, there are three types of uh, ships. Batela, which has oars, motorra, small um, or, uh, boats with an engine, and the rest would be called Baborea. All of them. It could be a... Baborea. <laughs> An aircraft carrier, doesn't matter. Uh, concerning terminology, uh, if uh, registrar or scriveners uh, are locals, muchas veces los historiadores nos rompemos la cabeza, es que el término este. They confuse us. Scriveners may use many different terms. And um, I would say that there's not a single ship that has one term in Basque, one single term in Basque in the uh, documents we use, because now it comes from a Catalan language, doesn't it? Where does the term galleon come from? Where does the term batel come from? Or pinaza, where does it come from? We're coming back to the theory you mentioned uh, earlier on. Everything we have in the Basque country comes from abroad. No, amal, ama con con el tema de de las fuentes. For uh, sources, and concerning what Luca just said, I tend to simplify things myself, not to make things more complex. 
um, at least um, when uh, we're dealing with all the different typologies and types of ships, uh, sometimes we don't so much concentrate on, on the source uh, we're using. Um, um, I use sources like insurance or contracts. You know, contracts are based on ships, but then um, notaries add elements like the name of the ship, the owner of the ship, etc. So um, you don't really need to. Uh, notaries just say. Um, use a single term and that's it. I mean, they don't really care. Um, there are other types of documents that are more careful when it comes to the terminology and you see that there are different classifications. Uh, and, well, uh, it depends. If I, uh, I'm dealing with a um, document drafted by a notary, I am very careful because it's a document that is not trying to define the ship as such. So they just use uh, more general terms and that's it. At the time, it was uh, very common, concerning what you said yesterday, Javier, when you uh, mentioned uh, the royal decrees concerning the uh, expedition by Magallan and uh, those decrees that mentioned the caravels. Right. Um, Papers from the 16th century are, uh, uh, include a num uh, long uh, or high number of uh, terms for the same reality. They, for instance, when you have uh, Lord, um, has a palace with a, ta uh, a tower on it. Um, this fact, the fact that the house has a tower, is not included in the documents, right? So, what I mean by this is that documents tend to uh, refer to palaces uh, or towers. Um, they are not referring to two different things, but just to the same uh, reality. So, when someone um, says the nows and galleons, they may not be referring to two different things. So, when we deal with um, standards, um, normally we tend to have texts that are apply to many different ships, to all of them, so that nobody says, no, you know, I have a whaler and since the law says so, uh, that it's only applied to nows, I'm not included there, right? So they tend to be very general and include all types of ships. You need to take that into consideration. And they may be referring to the same thing. The conference, uh, we've mentioned the term uh, shipwrecks and constructions and repairs. Uh, I would like to uh, mention the uh, um, return of remains, because there could be a good, re a good relationship um, uh, with Canada, for instance, but there is an international law that needs to be applied there. So could we ask uh, for original remains to be returned, the original remains of San Juan, for instance, or any other shipwreck uh, remains? Can, they, can we ask for that? Well, let's hope not, you see. <laughs> It would be, the, I think they're much better off in Canada, really, because we don't deal with them duly over here. Brad, anything? Well, the, the International Convention on Ship Ownership is fairly clear on this. Um, when the state is the owner of a ship, then, they can, then the state can reclaim ownership. Um, and in the case of the San Juan, the state was not the owner of the ship. Del buque, por lo tanto, ahí lo dejo. Bueno, con respecto, con respecto al asunto de, de la propiedad, si If I may, I would like to go back to uh, who should own what. Uh, the Swede say never again a basa, I believe he said. What does that mean? Well, uh, 
keeping uh, a wreck in good condition at a museum is not uh, a simple matter and it comes very, very expensive. So please, dear Canadians, look after our lovely, our, in inverted commas, lovely wreck, uh, well and proper. And uh, I totally agree with Xavi Alberti about what you said, about uh, how scriveners, uh, all those documents, uh, that, those records, uh, official records, uh, they were so thorough that uh, they were very repetitive, right? So sometimes uh, th that's where you get those long string of terms. Uh, Navarrete, for instance, uh, on his list of repair works, uh, he talks uh, about all the different ingredients down to the tar and uh, animal fiber and all sorts. Uh, and uh, he found as well how uh, terms uh, very often uh, were repeated or synonyms were used uh, one after the other and uh, that that goes for ship typology as well uh, I mean what was a carac I, I personally like the term now uh, for your wreck I tried to explain why proper, uh, partly why during my presentation yesterday and the Santa Maria, uh, Columbus's Santa Maria as well, would be that typology. Uh, right, uh, but your proposal, the proposal of the round um, uh, stern, uh, there are people who propose that it might have been a carac. Cristobal de Barros, for instance, uh, who uh, is our main witness, as it were, large nows uh, sometimes were defined as carac, uh, but uh, according to my calculations, they would be under 500 tons. Sorry, apologies, we didn't hear what he said. When I showed you that list uh, from 1534 with different vessels, I avoided uh, going into uh, this discussion or this controversy. And I think that list includes three or four caracs in the whole of Kipuzkoa. One of them belonged to uh, Marcin de la Renteria, that famous guy who went killing Turks left, right and centre with a massive carac. Well, in 1934, uh, his ship was found, what well, was recorded as being in Renteria. And Charles V, uh, or the first in English, uh, granted him a special coat of arms because of his deed where he uh, beat like 15 different Turkish uh, ships. And Charles I uh, just uh, loved this thing about dishing out coats of arms. So he went all over the place. He went bananas. Uh, that coat of arms had like uh, cinnamon sticks, peppercorns, what you call it. I mean, it was all there. Uh, and a ship uh, surrounded by massive great big ships surrounded by minute little ships. Why? Because that's a carrack, right? It's like 900 tons. That's, that's a big cheese. Then two other carracks uh, that I found on that list, uh, and funnily enough, uh, they were all at port. We're not in Ireland or in Seville. Uh, whenever a carrack is to be found in Seville, the few that uh, are found in, in uh, Gipuzkoa, sorry, uh, that are poor, uh, they're doing nothing. They're idle. Uh, why? Because they might have been serving the crown and they had special coats of arms and whatever. And the other carac, I can't remember the name of the vessel, sorry, but the owner was Aldamar. 
pero por ahí andan son menores que las de okay. la rentería. Smaller Cabral in this case, and Aldamar these two uh, were in Getaria. And Aldamar was the ship owner uh, who was a lord in Getaria with an amazing uh, tower. And just to give you an idea, Fabiola, the queen, uh, uh, Descend, is descended from Aldamar. So he, uh, Aldamar was uh, a, an important lord at the time. Another uh, case was Inigo de Arteta, uh, the man who designed the Spanish Armada, or he might have meant navy, sorry, and uh, the expansion policy uh, for the Spanish crown. He was the brain behind that, and uh, he was listed as a, a ship owner uh, for one of those few caracs, I insist. That's right, he says to something that we can't hear in the booth. You are quite right, he says. Yes, I'm talking about local caracs, yeah? I'm, I'm not saying uh, there were no caracs to be found in Genoa, for instance. I think uh, the confusion between now and Caraca is something that's coming up time and time again. What is a Carac? All it is, it's a big now, full stop. Uh, for instance, uh, if we look at Catalan documents, uh, Carac are never mentioned. So, uh, Looking uh, at the archives in Genoa, uh, that's the definition that's given uh, for Carax. The term uh, Carax supposedly comes from uh, Andalusi Arab. Carac would have been the word in, Arab, in Arabic. And then uh, the term uh, went into French, into English, into well, all the different European languages. So linguistically, that's the explanation. A carac is a grossa now, a large now. The omelina wreck, for instance, we excavated, uh, was uh, una nao grossa. 300 tons, a huge vessel. And those uh, massive ships were probably not built in the 16th or 15th centuries in the Basque country. They were not built, that's why they're not to be found in our records. Thinking about the Simancas archives, uh, I think the Real Carac was repaired in Pasaya, uh, that was 1,000 casks. Uh, it was huge. So I agree that uh, a carac would have to be over 600 or 700 tons. And about uh, that ship, ship owner, Alamar, he was a big fish. He, and he was also a, a high official in the uh, West Indies um, system. So I agree with Mikel. Since the mid-15th century, uh, these Basque ships were not just merchant ships. They were also uh, they were not tran just transporting cargo, sorry. They were also merchants. And uh, there are records uh, connected with Tarsk, with well, uh, all sorts. Uh, people like Aldamar, uh, who uh, are described as merchants. I think that was the time when that change took place. So, the change uh, between the uh, clinker technique uh, and the Carvel uh, technique might have been connected uh, with that as well. Because 
technological changes uh, often point out uh, to um, something that has to do with materials. For instance, in this case, scarcity of wood. It might have been. Uh, maybe that new style, the new style, uh, helped them be uh, more economic uh, with wood. And also uh, because uh, Moving from just doing transport to being merchants, those families uh, that made it, uh, that took that leap, uh, that had that new power and that progressed in society, then they would have wanted uh, different ships that made them look different and important, big ships that were fast. Ooh, I've been told uh, that uh, we have to finish uh, almost straight away. So I'm just going to take two more ta two more questions. We have to leave the room. Uh, apparently, uh, we, we are being invited to continue this conversation uh, at lunch. They, they said we could have lunch here. They said they have a nice cafeteria. Well, I'm just thinking that uh, we sometimes make a huge mistake thinking that the Basque country uh, finishes at the Pidasoa River. Uh, we're talking about uh, terminology in Basque, uh, and uh, I'm just terrified uh, because all uh, that's mentioned is what's ha what happens in the so-called Spanish Basque country. What happened uh, to all those ships that went to Newfoundland, for instance, before 1502? from Bayonne, for instance, to Newfoundland. Uh, all, all that part of Basque history uh, is being ignored, uh, I find. Uh, so we should talk not just about uh, the southern Basque country, but also the northern Basque country. Agreed. That's all I can say. Well, I don't have a question as such, but a comment. I think we need to uh, continue to research, uh, and as an archaeologist, I would like uh, to, uh, for us to be able to excavate our own wrecks, not just to rely on results from experts uh, from abroad uh, studying Basque wrecks abroad. Uh, I think we should... Uh, lobby as experts, uh, continue to research, find those wrecks and push hard uh, for them to be studied here. Thinking about the future, I mean, uh, getting uh, our public institutions engaged, convincing them of the relevance because uh, otherwise what we do here is seems to be like an exception to the rule. That's an absolutely beautiful final brooch for these two fantastic days. I have enjoyed myself thoroughly. And as I said, let's continue with this conversation in the dining room over lunch. Enjoy.